First, let me thank uh, Morris and Ramsey and the organizers of this conference. I, I want to congratulate you. Um, this um, kicking off this association uh, is always it's always a challenge. So it's it's, uh, a, it's an honor to be here. We've heard about housing co-ops. We've heard about financial co-ops, health co-ops, consumer co-ops. We've even heard academics, um, and even a physiotherapy potential co-op, right? So what we're going to do now is switch uh, to agriculture co-ops. And uh, or at least the framework I present was derived primarily from um, observing agriculture co-ops in 45 different countries, primarily in the 30 OECD countries, but um, in the last five years we've applied some of this work uh, to 15 developing country um, scenarios. I want to talk about, uh, there, there are a couple of magic words in this title, uh, regeneration is critical. I'll explain that in just a minute. Contemporary cooperatives and uh, the term cooperative per se, uh, but evolution. That evolution I want to give, uh, I want to stress how dynamic uh, organizational arrangements in changing institutional environments um, become and how important it is to understand the institutional environment and consequently adapt or develop organizational arrangements to interface uh, with the challenges brought about institutional environmental change. All right, this, uh, you won't be able to see this very well, but I want to um, really emphasize um, there are studies of cooperatives <coughs> At the macro level, this is where you see all co-ops in a jurisdiction um, will be examined. Currently, the EU, uh, the European Union, has a major study, 2 million euros, where looking at the laws of 27 EU countries and 6 non-EU countries just comparing, and they are shocked, not shocked, but uh, amazed at how different cooperative laws are in different countries. Um, in the U.S. alone, there are 110 different cooperative incorporation laws. So if you like diversity, uh, just the study of the macro existence. Now the objective of studies that look at this macro side of cooperatives uh, is to inform policy, per se. Then you have the meta, or group of co-ops. These could be industries, like you have Fepali, that is the dairy co-ops, the dairy industry of South America, but underneath that is a sector, a subsector of cooperative, dairy cooperatives <coughs> of Latin America. Uh, so this meta study is you're looking at a set of shared characteristics of interest um, and the objective is to detect generalizable th threats and to analyze integrated systems per se. And finally we see the microtype studies. Uh, we just heard one on China, uh, a comparison of two um, vegetable or small co-ops uh, in China. And that would be a micro study where you're looking at a single cooperative um, the, and usually you examine the constitutional or the governance side and then the operational strategic side. And the objective of these studies is to detect hierarchy or uh, ownership cost evasion. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Um, so just looking at uh, the, um, the complexity or the different views we can take of co-ops uh, is a challenge. I will argue that there are different life cycles in each of these areas. 
And so when you have simultaneous life cycles going on at different rates and within different sectors, uh, this makes analyzing cooperatives. And so I want to just congratulate the group here of mm -hmm. contemplating developing a research program uh, in uh, addressing these types of group action uh, per se. All right, what the concept of the emphasis of this presentation, and by the way, it's very difficult to talk to a group like this. Um, uh, there are academics in the crowd, there are real people in the crowd, there are <laughs> policy makers in the crowd, uh, and there are students in the crowd. So I mean, it's a heterogeneous group to begin with. And so what I'll try to do is this will probably be pretty abstract, but I'll try to bring in real world examples and, and so you can get your arms around it per se. The key point here, and if you notice, if you, if you listen to our first two speakers this morning, how, if you're not an academic, how, how uh, um, irrelevant most of what we do appears to be. I'm not knocking Morris's wonderful paper, I loved it. But how we have to focus so on such tiny issues that, that have tremendous implications. Um, and so this paper deals with one hypothesis coming out of the management literature. And that hypothesis is, over time, firms degenerate. In what I just said, I'm making the assumption that we'll view most cooperatives as firms. By the way, that's not a settled issue yet in, among academics. There are two schools of thought that cooperatives are extensions of someone's business, either let's say a farm, that a cooperative is just an extension of that, or a cooperative is a separate firm. So. These are two very, and they have a lot of implications for policy, etc. For this presentation, I'm going to assume uh, that most cooperatives in the contemporary world, those that have evolved over the last 80 to 100 years, are now considered to be firms. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that all co-ops are firms, but for this presentation, uh, that um, uh, we'll, we'll make that assumption. Now, so what we're going to do, or what the degeneration hypothesis says about firms, what the management profession and discipline has done, and I'm really oversimplifying here, is that once a firm gets started and it's going along, you want, you want stability in that firm but that leads to routines, norms, structures, which inhibit an organization's ability to adapt. All right? Eventually, this leads to bureaucratization, gridlock, groupthink, decreased competitive and eventual dissolution. This is the degeneration hypothesis. Right? And it's applied to most firms and most assumptions are that a firm has one life cycle. I'm sorry, you probably can't read that, so I'll, I'll read it for you. This presentation is about a counter hypothesis, regeneration. And this comes from observation of North American co-ops. And I, I think I could make the same generation about most OECD countries. Cooperatives have averaged, agriculture cooperatives in the OECD countries, 80 to 120 years in length. The average, average corporation in the US is seven years. So there's a tremendous difference between the longevity of a co-op and a non-co-op. And so, if we have, uh, what, what I'm going to argue is, is that somehow most co-ops 
have regenerated, and they've regenerated, and they're re they've regenerated. That itself is an interesting question as to why, uh, and uh, we can discuss that either in the panel uh, this afternoon or I'll, 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 I'll address it slightly in this presentation. So this is what, this is what we're going to talk about um, or share with you today. Now, this framework, some of you um, have seen this before, and I want to share those. Um, I've been here in New Zealand a number of times, and what we've been doing is working on this, this framework uh, for more than 15 years, and it keeps, you'll see by the end, it keeps getting more and more sophisticated and more complex. But it's important for this audience to just understand a couple of very simple things. If we look here on the y-axis, uh, we're going to look at the health of a co-op. You heard two papers this morning. Um, anyone who has dealt with cooperatives knows that just financial ratios are not the only measure of performance in a patron-owned organization. All right? And so we have uh, this institute I'll talk about uh, which we conduct uh, each year, uh, we, have, we have empirically identified 83 different measures of a health of a cooperative. All right? For our research, we've been using three or four distinct financial ratios and three to five non-financial ratios. So this is what we mean by health of a co-op. So this, this dimension of this, this x-axis is over time what we see is a cooperative goes through five phases. At first it has to justify itself. It's very costly to organize a cooperative. Very costly for the gentleman who's in physiotherapy I can argue that founding a co-op is costly. <coughs> And I'm assuming and people who found co-ops uh, are usually very high value uh, people. And so their time, and it's very time consuming, but it takes a lot of resources. This first phase, so if a co-op is formed, there must be a very good reason for it. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. The second phase, also it looked like short on this time frame, is the organizational design uh, phase. And for agriculture co-ops, this is an interesting uh, period. Farmers hate, they hate what attorneys do. Uh, they love to delegate to attorneys, uh, work up some bylaws, work on the Constitution, these type of things. These are boring, they're just not action-oriented type of thing. So notice, these first two areas appear to be short. But if you get it right the first time, or at least partially right, look at this next phase. This next phase, which we call growth, glory, and heterogeneity. And then, at some time, some time, positive heterogeneity. Heterogeneity, from a management point of view, particularly for long-run thinking is really positive. But over time, heterogeneity can turn neutral and then can turn negative. It can have negative implications, all right? And so, just for this picture, um, and for if those of you who can't see, this is where, these, these are the first two phases. This third phase looks like this. But during this time, and we'll talk about uh, what happens when heterogeneity turns from positive to negative, uh, problems start to arise. Friction starts in patron-owned firms. Um, patron-owned firms, each member has a different objective function. Back here, they didn't. At the beginning, the objective function of every member who stayed with the co-op into phase two, had a very similar homogeneous objective function. Or at least it was stated they did. 
But as time passes, and you, we'll, we'll go into we'll go into why why this <laughs> changes, and it's rational for most members. Okay. As we see friction, again, rural people have had a tendency, except in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealanders are <laughs> unique in this. But most rural people in most other countries sweep things under the rug. They don't like dealing with conflict and friction. So they'll sweep problems under the rug for some time before they finally as phase four says here, they'll recognize it. Some crisis usually happens, and then they go into a period of introspection. And finally, in phase five, what we do is we see them explore options. And I've just mentioned four options here. So this is uh, what we're going to argue in this presentation, is that when a cooperative gets to here, notice, Three of these options are to regenerate, okay? And we're going to argue that, um, just superficially, I would argue that Fonterra might already be in its third life cycle, and it's only 11 or 12 years old. Yet there are many cooperatives, multi-purpose <coughs> co-ops in the Midwest of the U.S. that are 85 years old and are in their first life cycle. Okay, so this, uh, this, this becomes, uh, this framework uh, is an interesting one, and it's one that you, as you deal with your own cooperatives, as you start to examine it, uh, you might use this framework to, uh, to, in a sense, get a sense uh, or a feeling of why the co-op is where it is with respect to its strategy and governance. All right. Phase one, I'm just, I'm going to, I would like to go through these very fast. Um, I'll be using academic terms here because it's a shortcut. But usually in, in phase one, a co-op is formed because of high market contracting costs. Okay, uh, another term for that is market failures. There's a bully in town and a group gets together to counter the bully. Uh, we academics call this market contracting cost. Or for scale and scope economies. Or more recently, and this, this is just happening in the last 15 years or so, uh, co-ops members, producers, will come together to extract rents, meaning these are offensive. Usually these are very defensive. These are, these are midfielders, and these are strikers, all right? It, it, you can think of it from that point of view in, uh, and most co-ops that exist today were formed here. When Jonathan talked about the farm credit system of the U.S. in 1916, the federal land banks were founded. Farmers could not, first of all, they couldn't get loans, but if they could, the maximum length of a loan was five years. Imagine paying off your farm in five years. Uh, and so the farm credit system lends money, mortgage, uh, 30 years, okay? Uh, so this, uh, the, 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 these co-ops in general were formed for, because of market failures. Okay, in the organizational design, the mechanism design, and I'll tell you, this is, this is so critical, so critical. When the Constitution and the set of bylaws are developed, the purpose, this is when producers or members should really pay attention. Those that do, this is when the screening goes on. And this is where you can really detect whether the cooperative is going to have high degrees of heterogeneity or not. Okay, this is a very critical time. Um, and usually the two major issues that are dealt with are control rights, and claimant rights, all right? So that's what happens here in organizational design. So then we get into this third phase. And this is, these are just notes to myself. Very quickly, um, I'm going to use the concept of ownership cost. Um, the person from Victoria, the nice presentation from Victoria on health co-ops, 
uh, you introduced Henry Hansman. He's the author, the developer of this, this concept, uh, per se. Uh, and um, those it, uh, ownership costs include three types of costs. His argument is this. Actually, there are four types. The market contracting costs, which we've already addressed, but then three other. Agency costs, that is the friction between principal, the owners, and the agent. Secondly, collective decision-making costs. And third, risk-bearing costs. All right? He argues that investor-owned firms, publicly listed firms, have higher agency costs than do patron-owned firms. He argues that it depends in collective decision-making cost and risk-bearing. Risk-bearing, he argues, in general, investor-owned firms have lower risk-bearing costs. So that's the basic theory we're going to use or implore, um, uh, employ here to discuss this life cycle. Um, neutral heterogeneity uh, can have negative or positive or neutral implications, and I want to give a dynamic not a static view uh, to this framework. All right. <clears throat> what does diachronic mean? Well, that would be a nice quiz. <laughs> We're trying to looking for a word that really suggests the evolution or time. This is over time increases in heterogeneity. And these we've identified like 20. But I just wanted to mention five. Disproportionate equity allocations. If we look, uh, um, I only know of a couple co-ops in New Zealand, but each one of them does not have, do not suffer from this. Uh, New Zealand, for some reason, has picked up uh, very early on that if you are going to deliver and benefit from patronizing a co-op, you are held responsible for contributing equity capital in the same proportion. In most of the world, that's not true. Over time, it's true at the beginning, but over time, this changes. And this is why you'll see the term horizon problem so much when you're reading the literature, particularly in North America. Um, and so we see disproportionate equity allocations. I might have been a founder of a cooperative in the U.S. And the, the board of directors, there's a nice term, this is what I did my PhD dissertation on, it's called discretion of the board. The board can keep and keep and keep, make decisions to keep the equity, and they can justify that based on their fiduciary responsibility. Okay, to keep this organization healthy. Well, along comes, I'm now 30 years into this co-op and they still haven't redeemed any of my equity, but I think of it as it's mine. And along comes my son. And not only does he receive the same benefits I do, he hasn't contributed anything from a capital point of view. All right? Not only that, he's demanding that he get, receives a young, new beginning farmer discount. <laughs> so th this, in many of the countries, this disproportionate equity allocation leads to father against son, mother against daughter. This is an interesting, interesting phenomenon. Patron drift, this means membership changes. And remember, we argued back in economic justification that there was, there was an, align, an alignment of transactional, situational, and judgmental preferences. Those three preferences were aligned. As new members enter and current members leave, this alignment starts to maybe weaken. Okay? Membership growth will do the same thing. Substitution effect. Some members leave for convenience sake, uh, because the terms are better from a non-coop or a different cooperative. We'll see diversification exacerbated uh, by transactional differences. 
Does a cooperative have a transportation subsidy for those who live 125 miles versus five miles from a delivery point? That's a transactional difference. Do you think friction start to, my best drinking buddy from college lives 100 miles away and now I'm against him? These are frictions you would never detect in an investor-owned firm. All of these are unique to patron-owned firms. That's, that's anyone who tells you that an investor-owned firm is no different than a patron-owned firm is very uneducated regarding organizational design, okay? Okay, this, uh, let, let me just go through, uh, I'll skip this because of, of time, but uh, these are, these are uh, issues that are emerging when, when success, and you'll see on the next slide, success revisited. When, when cooperatives emphasize growth, and we heard, it was very interesting, the four bankers uh, this morning, why did, you, why did the banks come through this uh, so well? They put patronage and services to members higher than growth objectives. They didn't, they, they don't, none of these four uh, denied the importance of growth. Growth is important, but patronage or the patron receives first attention. Okay? Now, these, uh, this is, this might be what happens. Um, it's very interesting. We've started, we don't have enough data to make this statement, but I'll make this statement if you don't quote me. Um, what we have found is cooperatives uh, in North America, four years after they've had their best year, seem to really run into trouble. This is an interesting phenomenon. When you have your best year, maybe even on the farm, you have money. You, normally you don't have money. You don't have choice of <laughs> where you spend your money. You have all these obligations. When you have money that there's no obligation for it. This is when you make mistakes. This is when you have choices. And this is a very interesting, I don't want to get too much into the whole free cash flow issue, uh, but we have some very interesting uh, observations of cooperatives who um, had so much money, they thought they could play with the big boys every day. And that's, that's an interesting challenge uh, for usually capital-constrained organizations. Okay, what happens when you have, when this heterogeneity that led to great ideas and growth, uh, when it, then these frictions start to arise? Little frictions, then larger frictions. Um, I don't have the slide in here on vaguely defined property rights, but what happens is these frictions emerge into usually one of five forms. Horizon problem, portfolio, internal free riding, influence cost, and some type of agency. And, and those of you who, who read my material, you can, you can get all of that on my website. But what happens when those emerge is we see different subgroups form. Distributional coalitions. Usually we, we're reluctant to acknowledge these, at least right away, but these symptoms, these vaguely defined property rights, lead to behavior that starts increasing ownership costs. Either collective decision-making costs, it takes longer to make a decision, or they Making decisions become very costly, or the risk-bearing cost increase, or this principal-agent conflict starts really, really gridlocking decision-making process. So this is, uh, this is phase four of this life cycle. Phase five, this is what would normally happen. You either go bankrupt, you sell, whatever, if you were an investor-owned firm. 
she ran into this problem. Well, investor-owned firms don't have these patron frictions, so they normally don't run into this. They run into other types of challenges, and that's why their life lasts one, one, one cycle. But patron-owned firms have these four as options. Tinkering and reinventing. I'll, I'll concentrate on these two. This is when a cooperative decides usually to exit. Doesn't mean exit or go out of business, it means changes its organizational form. And if we were to talk about a perfect example, a diamond walnut, 100 years old in the US, if you, if you eat walnuts, diamond dominated walnuts, a, a small $300 million walnut, corp, all they handled were walnuts, okay? Overnight, they decided to publicly list and they grew for an interesting period of time and now the CEO is in jail along with the CFO and uh, they tried to buy Pringles. Imagine this little quant trying to buy Pringles for 2.3 billion. Okay. And uh, they just, they believed in themselves, guys. <laughs> but what's interesting, that's what we call exit. Tinkering there has to be a healthy tension in a co-op. This is, this is something people don't like, and I keep listening to preachers about co-ops. If you think of a co-op as a firm, you're going to have winners and losers on every decision. There has to be a healthy tension. But this tension, and I'll say it in my last comments, there has to be a balance between violent tension and just smiling faces. This, this, and wise people know what he, uh, healthy tension is. And it's critical, it's important for all democracies. It's very important for all patron-owned firms. Uh, but um, we don't have time to go in. Tinkering means you, you play, but you don't change the ownership rights. Either the control rights, or the claimant rights. Reinventing, you change one of those, all right? Spawning is, it's a nurtured, it's not a spin-off, but a group, the, the co-op becomes in a sense of padrino, of, uh, of um, another cooperative group, per se, an exit I've explained. All right, again, here's what we've just done. We've just I've just explained one, one life cycle. This is what we're observing. We're seeing cooperatives. This is the end of that first life cycle. And this cooperative, at least, decided to go on to either reinvent itself or tinker. And again, and again. Now notice, one of the interesting things is each of these little life cycles it's a little shorter each time. That, that could be, uh, there are enough academics in here that would, they could come and, and maybe it's technology. It's product life cycles are getting shorter. What we're seeing is organizational entity life cycles appear to be getting shorter. Um, it's an empirical question. Uh, but this is, this is what we're seeing. But the important point here is Co-ops regenerate themselves. This, this is the really important thing. Um, they, this healthy tension, and in this case, this cooperative would have had positive healthy tension. They kept reinventing and re-tinkering. As a matter of fact, this happens to be uh, Florida Natural, if any of you have ever seen, if you've ever been to the States, you see these Orange Grove owners, just a thousand of them, they own 10 packing houses. And they're up against Coca-Cola's Minute Maid and Pepsi-Cola's Tropicana. And these guys have beat Coca-Cola in not from conservation. Just these thousand little farmers. And it's the most amazing co-op. And they believe, they started in 1933, and I, I do these sessions with their board and management at the same time. 
Management thinks they're in their fourth life cycle. The board thinks they're in their fifth life cycle. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting uh, interpretation watching them uh, go through this. And they use this uh, for uh, a diagnostic tool. All right, this, now this is the ownership cost part. Uh, those of you who don't like academia, rest for a minute. Um, but I want to point this out. If we go up this axis, we're talking about ownership cost. The theory of ownership cost is the higher the ownership cost, the less chance you have of surviving against your rivals. Whoever has the lowest ownership cost, all things equal, that is technology and such of the ability, if you, if you pay market wages, and cetera, what will kill the firms on the bottom are those that have the highest ownership cost. Okay, that's, that's the, this theory. So, this, if we go along this axis, it's the probability of degeneration. So let's take a look at this. Low probability of degeneration is a result of persistent, successful tinkering. When you keep tinkering, you keep your ownership costs low. Low probability of degeneration. Now, another way to stay alive is to constantly have enemies on the outside who are, who are potential market, market power abusers. As markets become global and you've had a stable domestic market, now you see outsiders come in. Now you have a new enemy. Enemy in this case meaning they're bringing in perhaps they have the ability to, to cause market failure. Market failure. People stick together if they see an outside enemy. People start Groups start to break up or fragment if they no longer have that. All right? Now, let's go here. Who, when do you degenerate? Well, it's when you don't make a difference anymore. There are a hundred other, there are a hundred other, I, I watch consumer co-ops in the U.S. when Walmart moves in with a super center. I mean, Walmart sells for 25% less than anyone. And Walmart's got this special buyer that buys local. And now the local food co-op lost its local advantage and it's charging 20% more than Walmart a super center. This is, this is tough. And what you see is slowly members leaving. I watch my own wife, she's become a super center buyer, and I, no matter what I say, and it, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's true, all right? And so this is, at that, how do we do this, huh? <laughs> uh, that, that's what this means, result of weak exogenous economic justification. You can't justify a group action anymore. You used to be able to, but not anymore. And here, probability of degenerating, it's a result of unsuccessful attempts, ownership costs. You have, you have strategic errors, or you have governance problems, but you just can't, you don't get your act together. So this is a very simplified uh, approach uh, to, in, at looking at uh, this life cycle. And the life cycle suggests you always want to be in this quadrant, okay? You want to be in this, so you, and that means to be tinkering or reinventing means you're going to have tension. If you're going to constantly be re, partially restructuring or tinkering, you're going to have tension, all right? Now, very quickly, I want to go through. Um, Jonathan Logan was talking about uh, CoBank and the farm credit system. Uh, this is an institute which uh, I'm the director of. It's located at the University of Missouri. And on its board of directors are 15 of 
the most prominent uh, cooperative CEOs in the U.S. And Jonathan's boss is one of them. He's the vice chair, but Land O'Lakes and DFA, and Ocean Spray, Sunkiss, Florida Natural. These are, these are the types of CEOs who sit. And what they do, they advise me regarding uh, cooperative, cooperative leadership, cooperative theory, cooperative teaching. And what we do is, let's say we just finished our summer institute. Where 70 to 75 of the vice presidents from these firms come in, we spend a full week. That fosters networks, relationships, trust, which generate ideas, opportunities for students, customized programs, exchanges. Then we bring in other academics from finance, organizational economics, etc., and we develop models, both inductive and deductive. That leads to model testing. We, the academics win because we can publish. Then we translate these into cases, outreach, presentations, and it improves all of our other outputs. Now, this has been going on for 40 years, uh, and it takes tremendous uh, energies to get this system going. Uh, but what's interesting in it is the life cycle came from more than 2,000 observations of CEOs, vice presidents, directors, middle management, giving their opinion about phase three. Remember phase three, heterog growth, heterogeneity, growth, glory, and heterogeneity. That's, these, these are the guys, this is the system we work, use to generate these models. Now, I want to uh, I want to show you the first time I came to New Zealand. This is how far we were, and this is ownership rights and um, you're, you're either traditional co-op. This was kind of the year. These were the European co-ops: member investor, proportional investment. Then we had new generation co-ops, and then these the ownership rights were not restricted to members, and these are the types of partial co-ops you saw emerging. Then, our next advance, uh, we started seeing all of these co-ops, these traditional co-ops, etc., by non-member businesses for a number of reasons, to generate capital, uh, to buy knowledge, uh, etc. So, so we started seeing the twig effect on this fallen tree. Okay. And what we did is we could put on this, these, these seven branches, we felt of the 25,500 ag co-ops in the OECD countries, we could put on 95% of them somewhere on here. So, so it was, in five minutes you walk in and you ask a couple of questions, those questions, oh, excuse me, uh, those questions being, are your ownership rights restricted to member patrons? Are the ownership rights redeemable? Are the ownership rights just benefits to patrons? Are they proportional or not proportional? If you ask those four questions, you can put, it, it's amazing how quickly uh, you can start to diagnose your co-op. This is where we are now. If you notice, we've now put the life cycle in each one of these, and we have to figure out how to make this look like you just you can stay here traditional. You can tinker. T means tinker. R means reinvent. Uh, and how you can just do this. C means constitutional, and this means operation strategy. But the key thing is we're simplifying it at the same time, making it more sophisticated. And um, this is coming from this inductive uh, observation surveys. Uh, we have over 700 mini cases now that they wrote for us. In their four days there, they have to write the life cycle of their own organization. All right, recently I had a chance to, uh, somebody called me old, and cetera, and so when you get old, you have to start reflecting, and I had a formal chance to reflect on, on my career. And that brought me to the point of thinking about these 
wonderful professors I had and wonderful CEOs and board chairs, etc., that have influenced me over my life. And fortunately, I've had 12 years where I was in the real world. I was the CEO of two co-ops, and I sit on many boards. And so many of these people were very wise, and they kept instructing me. And so let me just share, um, in a talk I had to give, I shared these four points, the things that I learned from these great mentors, and uh, see if you agree with any of them. The primary goal of cooperation is to create a collective good that is to be distributed proportionally to enhance the socioeconomic well-being of members. The key thing here is to create a collective good. Uh, those of you who are in academics know that there are common pool resource goods, private goods, public goods, and toll or club goods, which could be called collective goods. So some type of good is being created. The friction in co-ops is how you make the decision on the distribution of that collective good. Okay? But the critical thing, and you might, everybody in this room might think this is common sense. I was just at the World Bank and I'm giving a presentation and the head of collective action for the Middle East and Northern Africa comes up to me and argues, Middle Eastern people, acting groups, they really are good at collective action, but it's only to create private goods, not a collective good that's distributed. And it was very, very interesting. They said, when a house falls down, everybody goes and helps build that house. But there is no collective good produced. Very interesting. He said they want to avoid the friction caused by distributing a collective good. And that's his experience. He stuck for 30 years dealing with collective action in the Middle East and Northern Africa. And I was always wondering why you don't see what we would call cooperatives in those countries. Very interesting comment. Anyway, second observation I've learned from my mentors. Cooperation, if led and governed well, will embed a higher level of civility into our everyday commercial, social, and private lives. This, to me, is a really important, really important, I think every speaker we had this morning was saying that in a different way. And I think it's really important for all of us to remember this. Cooperation, if led and governed well, will embed a higher level of civility into our everyday commercial, social, and private lives. I only have one slide after this, so those of you who are hungry, uh, uh, don't worry. This, this is, a, this is uh, uh, the United States has done a lot of unpopular things, a lot of things not very well done, but one thing they did well was a period in the 1700s when they decided to change the Articles of Confederation to the U.S. Constitution. And over just a period of 10 months, 85 essays were written by three authors called the Federalist Papers. And this quote, and I'll, I'll give it, comes from Federalist Paper number 10. And what it's about is what destroys democracies, and I think of cooperatives as democracies. To be successful, this is Mike Cook's writing and then I'll get to it. To be successful in cooperating is like being successful in life, an exercise in balancing. By the way, when you're young, you don't believe this. I know that. <laughs> I never did. But as you get older, you start, you start seeing how balancing things in your life uh, really helps. It's important to remember that cooperatives are experiments in commercial democracy. When involved in this experiment, we are guided by the wisdom of James Madison, who wrote in the Federalist Papers, number 10 if you're reading them, that uncontrolled factions in democracies create instability, injustice, and confusion. And he followed that statement with this, diversity must be celebrated, not squelched. Just take a look at those two statements. Are, they balance each other. 
Consequently, leading and governing cooperatives demands the science and art of balancing the interests of factions with the primary objective of creating a collective good. And this, this, is, uh, uh, this is the challenge. You have to be much more sophisticated. You have to be wiser to really lead and govern uh, a cooperative. And finally, the challenge challenge to all of us. There's a type of genius that exists in successful co-ops. Let's call it co-op genius. Many of you have seen it. Many of you have seen it practiced. When you see it practiced, nurture it and don't let it get away. We must now learn to identify and share cooperative genius. Thanks.